Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. It is Tuesday, February 23rd at 2021. And welcome to another Tuesday with Tom. Tuesday with Tom, of course, is brought to you by our partners, the Best Girl Consulting Firm, Best Girl Customizes Solutions to Issues of Leadership, Access and Inclusion, Economic Development, Executive Coaching, and Communications. Best Girl creates the solution that fits your needs. So we're here. We're still in Black History Month. We've got a lot of Black history uh, to talk about this morning. But first, let's talk a little bit about the weather. I hope the weather where you are today is better than it's been across the country the last two weeks. Uh, I can tell you that the weather has just been incredible. It's been extreme. And we have to wonder why it's so extreme. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the 24 news cycle, when the weather is over, the news goes away. But I can tell you that when you're involved in one of those extreme weather situations, and we've been involved in weather, extreme weather situations throughout this year, uh, it's a long time. I had a doctor's appointment last week. And in that conversation, the doctor told me that they had been in Hurricane Sally, just like we were here. And it has been six months and they are still digging out. They are making repairs. Their house was flooded. They're not fully able to live in their house and they have yet to start dealing with the insurance company which means they're not, there's not any compensation right now for everything that they're having to do. People in Panama City and nearby areas are still recovering from Hurricane Michael. And so the whole point to this is, you know, we do the news cycle and then it goes away and we think it goes away and so it's done. But no, there are people still recovering from hurricanes, from the snow and the ice, and I think we should remember them. And, um, make sure that we keep them in our thoughts and keep them in our in our prayers. Last week, I posted a piece on my personal Facebook page about history. It's Black History Month. And it is something I dug out to use in a speech. It wasn't something directly related to Black history. Uh, I, I'm delivering a talk to some university students later on today. And so I thought it would be, and I knew we had a historian on the show today. So I thought it'd be great to talk a little bit about hi Black history. The quote is, history, certainly it is ugly to face things in our history, but denial is worse. I didn't post that for any particular reason other than I liked it and I thought that uh, it was very relevant to some of the things going on today. I got a lot of comments, about 90% of them were positive. There were a couple of people who wanted to make it about their politics. Um, I think it's relevant to black history, but it's also relevant to a lot of other areas of our history. Frankly, I take it to mean that our history is our history. Pretend it didn't happen or only tell one version, his story of it, we're bound to repeat it. And it's happening over and over again. So I guess the summation of that is if the shoe fits, you know what's next. Um, I started doing black history facts at the beginning of February, and I'm just going to keep on doing them. I may keep on doing them throughout the rest of the year because I think it's interesting. But last week, I saw Roots on television. Roots, man, 1977, uh, the, 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 the miniseries based on the international slave trade out of Africa, bringing the slaves to the southern United States. It's Alex Haley's a 1976 novel based on that. It first aired on ABC. Roots was absolutely incredible. It was probably the first time that the slave trade had been dramatized as such. Roots won 37 Primetime Emmy Awards. It also won a Golden Globe and a Peabody. It received unprecedented Nielsen ratings for the finale, which still holds a record as the third highest rated episode any type of television series. The second most watched overall series finale in U.S. history. Uh, with those viewing numbers, it wasn't just Black people who were interested in that segment of history, and it was produced on a budget of $6.6 .6 million. But as graphic as the brutality in Roots was, it doesn't match what actually happened. I talk about this because of the very quote I read at the beginning, history. Certainly it is ugly to face things in our history, but denying that those things happen is actually worse. 
Let me read a piece, this piece from a calendar put out by the Equal Justice Initiative regarding the effect of slavery on black families. After Congress banned the international slave trade in 1808, growing Southern demand for enslaved agricultural labor fueled the largest domestic slave trade in history. More than one million black people were enslaved, were sold to traders in the upper South, moved hundreds of miles to the lower South by rail or boat, or forced to march on foot in trained coffles, and then they were sold again. The physically brutal and humane enterprise devastated black families. Roughly half of all enslaved people were separated from their spouses and their parents. About one in four of those sold were children. Ads for the Thomas L. Grazer and Company Slave Mart in Montgomery, Alabama, boasted that it had, quote, constantly on hand, large and well-selected stock of black boys and girls. When you think about the reality, it makes the slave owner names on many of our many of our universities and colleges across this country even more egregious. Okay, let's uh, go to our roundtable guest today. Barbara Wallace Edwards is here. Michael Walker here, and our G list guest today is a historian. And so we're going to get into a lot of this. Is a historian and professor Maurice Hobson. So let me introduce the two roundtable guests, Barbara Wallace Edwards. Barbara, of course, is from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, she's been with us since the very beginning. This is our 23rd show. And Barbara, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Good morning to you. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. So tell me what's happening in your world. Well, Tom, I'm, I'm enjoying some of this beautiful weather. If you recall, last Tuesday, we had snow on the ground here in Birmingham, but yesterday was absolutely beautiful. It was like a spring day, and I think we're going to have the same type of weather today. So I'm enjoying the weather. I, I'm still praying for our friends and family across the country who are experiencing bad weather, uh, especially those in Texas who are into a deep freeze. And so um, prayer for, for all of those involved. And um, I want to add, too, that I had a chance to listen to your podcast with Annie Bertram uh, from last week. And you are history. <laughs> you are living part of Auburn University history. And my hat's off to you, Tom, for what you endured and, and the changes you instituted there at Auburn University. And I want to say thank you for, for from all of us to you. Uh, you well, you are you. our hero. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I will tell you this. Uh, I was on a, another podcast uh, from an Auburn guy, and he told me that he nicknamed me the Dean. And yes. I said, well, what are you talking about? He says, yes. you're the Dean of the African-American athlete at Auburn University. Yes. And I thought that was pretty cool, but I like being called the Dean. It's like, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll be the Dean. It's but no, I, I do. I, I I appreciate that, and uh, you know, you. One of the questions Andy asked me was, "Did I realize what we were going through at the time?" And yeah, I did. And and I mean, yes. we can talk about that. But I was a big admirer of Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and Kurt Flood and all those right. athletes during that era who worked to make the changes in the community. And and I felt like maybe I could be one of those. And yes. uh, that was my whole thing. That would be, and we've talked, we were talking before the show about the civil rights movement. That was how I could participate in the civil yes. rights movement. And so I, I yes, it was, uh, it was incredibly special. And, you know, it's special now because there's the legacy part of it and you get to work with the young people and uh, yes. talk to them about history in the past and how history doesn't have to repeat and how my talking about my story doesn't lessen you, doesn't right. make you less of a person. Hopefully it enlightens you. So absolutely. Anyway, uh, let's get Michael on here. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm going off on a, <laughs> on a tangent here. <laughs> Michael, good morning. How are you, man? What's going on with you? Well, I'm doing well. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Barbara. I hope you both are well. 
Uh, Tom, I guess instead of calling you TG like I normally do, I guess I have to call you the Dean from now. I'm the Dean now. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I have to admit, I like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we were. I, I will retire to moniker TG and now call you the Dean. <laughs> well, I always be TG. I, people still call me that from college and high school. So, what's ha what's happening in your world, Michael? Well, I have to tell you guys, I always try and bring some health related news because I'm in that business. And, you know, yesterday we celebrated, well, we didn't really celebrate, but we acknowledge 500,000 Americans that have passed away uh, since COVID. Uh, and, you know, everybody's working to try to get these vaccines out and get them into people's arms. We have another uh, trial that's going to be taking place and a panel that's going to be looking at J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson. They have a vaccine and they're going through the final step, the final steps that Pfizer and Moderna took where they met with disease experts and they talked to and discussed about the effectiveness of their vaccine. And then the next day after that meeting, Pfizer and Moderna were approved. So hopefully this will be the last step for J&J. &J. But there's a few things to know about J&J's vaccine. On the positive side, it can be shipped and stored at normal refrigerator temperatures rather than having to be in ultra cold storage, which means the lifespan of the vaccine will last longer. Uh, on the downside is J&J technology for that vaccine, they do not use what's called RNA technology. Pfizer and Moderma does. RNA technology, trains the immune system to repel the coronavirus, both are rated at 95%. J&J &J trials came out that they were 66 effective. However, on the positive side for that is they are near complete protection against severe coronavirus and hospitalization and preventing death. So you have positives on one side, negatives on the other side. However, the fact that it's only one shot and only has to be refrigerated at normal temperatures and not ultra cold storage also is a plus. So we will find out that's going to take take place this week and hopefully we'll have something else on the market. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let me ask you guys, uh, I'm going to skip the subject just for a minute and go back into a little sports history before we go back to our, before we go to our guests. And that sports history sounds a couple, uh, surrounds a couple of things. I think that one thing you sent me, Michael, and the other thing that came to my attention, and it was about two athletes, uh, one that we know personally, uh, William Andrews, and then uh, Neon Dion. So William Andrews, there's discussion about him. Will he get into the Hall of Fame? He's been passed over, and now he's years uh, guys who aren't active or whatever who haven't been active for a while um and william says he doesn't think he is getting going to get in because he played fullback and that's not a position that really uh almost doesn't exist anymore uh when you talk about the traditional fullbacks um and then uh you guys can take either one and then then neon di Dion's a coach at Jackson State, which I think is pretty cool because I think he'll be able to help those kids get the recognition uh, from the NFL and the university will get the recognition from the NFL. So tell me what you guys think about those two characters and let's see who, whichever one of you want to start. Barbara, go ahead. Well, I'll just start saying, you know, I, William started our university with Michael and I, we were classmates at all. And so of course we think the world of him and I know I've his career throughout the NFL. Um, I think the numbers are there. I think he definitely should be inducted into the hall of fame. Um, you know, it, like he says, the fullback position doesn't really exist anymore as we knew it back then. So time, you all know, will tell, but I definitely think he should. He, I wonder he, if Larry uh, Zonka is in the hall, added of, fame. To the hall of fame. I think he is. Because he's a I think traditional so. fullback. Fullback. Yes, he was a fullback. I think he is. That's as true. As a matter of fact. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I concur with Barbara. Uh, and I have to make note of the fact that when William was at Auburn, he played in the same backfield with James Brooks and Drill Cribs. And uh, now, 
Explain to me how Auburn did not win the national championship with James Brooks, Joe Cribs, William Andrews, Reese Tutal McCall, first round draft choice as a tight end, and all the other studs. I think it was. Well, I can I can go a step further than that. Tell me right. why they didn't have a winning record. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. National championship. Why couldn't they yeah, just win true. more games than they lose? That's true. <laughs> did not make any sense. <laughs> and you know, it's so funny. When William came out of uh, Auburn and got drafted by the Falcons, he took the NFL by storm because people didn't think he could run because right. he was used as a blocking right. back primarily he, to he open holes for, yeah, for Joe Cribs and James Brooks. So, But uh, right. I think he should have the opportunity to go into the Hall of Fame. As I mentioned earlier, that the, the critics that will – probably not want to support it will say he didn't have a long enough career. But if you look at his numbers and what he did with his opportunity there, they're unmeasured. And I will say this, Gail Serios had a short career as well. Very much so. And, and William's numbers right. are right there in line with Gail Sayers. Well, so, if he's with Gail Sayers, he, right. he's, he's incredible. But I think Gail Sayers just made it look so good when he, <laughs> He'd run. Right. Hell, Sales could plant both feet and, and, and run sideways. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. let's let's talk about Dion quickly here. Uh, what do you guys think about Dion? First of all, at Jackson State, how well do you think they'll do? Or, or what what is success going to look like? in besides just winning football games, anybody? Well, I'll um, say Coach that. Prime. Yeah, Coach Prime. Well. I was going to say that I think success, in addition to winning football games, will be the opportunity of Dion bringing in a higher caliber of athlete to the Jackson State football program. And what I mean by that, the transfer reporters, uh, player, players like uh, that leave Auburn and Alabama and places like that, they will probably – go to play at Jackson State, and Dion can lure those players there, which will increase their, their level of high-profile athletes there. Here, here's, here's a question I, I'll ask, and I know that uh, Maurice, uh, our historian who's going to be on here in just a minute, is from Jackson, and I'm just wondering if if Dion will be able to cut into uh, a couple of three, four, five-star prospects that Ole Miss won't. Uh, uh, Mississippi State wants, or even Auburn, Alabama, Auburn wants, will he be able to cut into that and bring some of those kids to Jackson State? I think there's a possibility. You know, there has been a trend lately yeah. of some five-star athletes choosing to go to HBCU schools, and particularly in basketball that's happened where several top prospects uh, decided to go play at Howard University and some other schools. Uh, Howard was the first one that comes to mind. So, and usually basketball starts a trend like that and then football comes along. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's uh, not able to do that. I think he will be. Okay. Uh, Barbie. I, I agree. I agree. I agree with, with, uh, with what Michael said there. Um, I think that, that Dion is probably going to, um, Get bring in more dollars for Jackson State, so they're going to, be able to upgrade their facilities there. And once their facilities on the same level, or, or at least close to the level of some of the, the higher echelon schools, I think that he will probably be able to recruit the five-star, four-star athletes without any problem. At all. I think the biggest difference will be what the kids want from a college experience, and. If you want to play for a national championship, then you go to Alabama. If you if you want to play for a big time program, uh, you go to one of the SEC schools. If you want to play good quality football, but also at the same time maybe have a, a, a social uh, life that's enlightening and rewarding and you don't have to deal with the whole idea of uh, slaveholders' names on your buildings and things such as that, I, I, I think you'll have some kids that are, are um, more aware, societally aware of who they are and where they are and where they're going. And if you're good enough to make it, you're going to make it from any school. Uh, uh, if you're good enough to be a high round draft choice, then it may it may not hurt you at all. 
uh, you will certainly be bucking the trend, though. Um, anything else from you guys? Okay, well, let's go to our let's go to our corporate message, and then we'll go to our G list guest. Best Girl is a consulting firm that provides customized leadership, access and inclusion, public relations, communications, and organizational consulting services. Clients include Fortune 500 companies, utilities, higher education institutions, small businesses, and associations. Best Girl's team of consultants, led by Joyce Gilly Gossam, Emily Hedrick, and Sean Jones, partners with business and education clients to promote organizational effectiveness, communication, motivation, and leadership, with always an impact on the bottom line. Best Girl's customized consulting services include strategic planning, corporate communication, executive coaching, fundraising, and economic development. All right. So now let's get to the G list. And I'm excited about the G list. I know this young man. He's been around for a while. And matter of fact, we kind of we work in a couple of the same organizations. So the G list where everybody is a star. Remember, Hollywood has the A list. And here on Tuesdays with Tom, we have the G list. The G list guest is Dr. Maurice Hobson. He's a historian, a social scientist, an Africana studies scholar, a social justice champion, and he is a producer. Uh, he's associate professor of African-American studies and historian at Georgia State University. He earned his PhD in history, focusing in African-American history and 20th century U.S. history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research interests are grounded in the fields of African-American history, 20th century U.S. history, comparative labor, African-American studies, oral history, and ethno ethnography. 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 Thank you, brother. <laughs> I knew you'd bail me out there. <laughs> Urban and rural history, political economy, and popular culture. So thanks, man. Thank Welcome to the show. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here, brother. Always a pleasure to be with a legend like yourself, the Dean. It's always a pleasure to be with the Dean. <laughs> the Dean. The dean. <laughs> so tell me about the Black New South. So the Black New South is a political theoretical framework that I created uh, in my research. And, and what, what it basically looks at is how the Civil Rights Act of 1964 coming out of Birmingham, particularly with the Birmingham Civil Rights Campaign and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, how they politically changed the American South and how it promotes a return migration of Black Americans back to the American South. So most recently, Charles Blow has come out talking about, you know, hey, people should move back South. He's, he's, he's 20 years behind the game. Um, Black folk have been Charles moving Blow, back. Charles Blow is a columnist for the New York Times. Ex 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 exactly. Yeah. And um, Black folk have been returning South since 1964, 1965. And so what this really does, what it articulates is oftentimes it is widely believed that the civil rights movement took place in the 1950s and 60s. The truth of the matter is that the, the modern civil and human rights movement starts in 1526 when the first Africans arrive on the shores. We're still dealing with it today. Um, indigenous people have participated in civil rights. Women have participated in civil and human rights. And so it's a longstanding tradition. So what the Black New South is, is it politically looks at the barriers that were moved legally that promoted yeah. citizenship and voting. And once this happens, Black folk who had participated in the Great Migrations moving north, midwest, west, began to move back home because then the American South becomes the, the next frontier for opportunities in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, business, uh, and a great quality of life. Oh, man, that's very, very interesting. So uh, you, we were talking before the show, and we were talking about Alabama in particular. Uh, you and I have had conversations where we say most of the the black people immigrated from Alabama. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> give us a little bit of information about that. So, so you know, the American South um, is a very spirited region of the of, of the United States, um, but it also carries, you know, some of the greatest scars of uh, uh, American life. I mean, particularly steeped in American slavery. I mean, so when you go from East Texas all the way up to Virginia, Maryland. Um, and, and, and your border states of, you know, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, we have to deal with that complicated issue of race. And it's not just a Southern thing. 
it's an American thing because we have to understand that all of the laws and policies that were created around slavery came out of the White House. So this is a this is a national issue, this issue of race. But the thing about it is after the American Civil War, um, when the Union prevailed, uh, the South still doesn't recognize that all the time. And we saw that take place on January 6th. Um, Black Americans for about a 15 year period enjoyed a moment to where they voted, um, they had citizenship and they voted in their own interest. Well, what happens with that is once that's taken away in the 1880s and you see this recalcitrant nature or this gripping take place to put black people back in their place, you see great migrations. You see black folk who leave the American South and go different places. Well, one of the things that is unique is oftentimes we see where black folk left because they look for a better life, but you also had the majority of black folk who stayed. Yeah. And when they stayed, they stayed because they were there. That's where they were from. That's where big mama and big daddy were buried. That's where they, that's the land that they grew up. There's their blood stained that soil. As a result of that, these black folk were fighting. So don't ever assume that black folk were not a fight, what we're not fighting the whole time. And so when we begin to really look at ground zero in terms of the civil rights movement, and this is not to take away from the, the, the lore of any other state, Alabama becomes particularly strong because of the civil rights legislation that comes out of Alabama, particularly Birmingham, Selma. We can look at Tuscaloosa, we can look at Montgomery, we can look at Tuskegee, we can look at all aspects of how things work. And one of the things about it is Atlanta, a city like Atlanta becomes a haven for those that have really participated in the battlegrounds of the civil rights movement in Jackson, Mississippi, or Alabama, or, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, the Carolinas, Tennessee, They're, they come to Atlanta. And as a result of this, you see this large influx of civil rights influence that comes out of Alabama. I mean, Dr. King gets his start in Montgomery. Um, Andrew Young marries a woman from, from, from Alabama. So does, so does Dr. King. Uh, Vernon Johns was one of Dr. King's mentors in terms of the civil rights movement. I mean, you got Joanne Robinson. Uh, we, we talk about the Montgomery bus boycott. We, we begin to look at, you know, uh, John Lewis, you know, who's from Troy, Alabama. Um, you, you got Joseph Lowry. You got Ralph David Abernathy. So you have, a, a, you have Dorothy Cotton, the women of the civil rights movement. So you have a real groundswell in Alabama that's able to go to these different places and really be influential. So let me take that a step further and ask, why is it that Alabama seems to not have progressed as much as say its neighbor Georgia? And I agree with you hundred percent that most of the civil rights stuff and many of the leaders emanated from Alabama. Well, you know, you know, it's, it's particularly interesting that you ask this question. And uh, I, I live in Georgia. Uh, I live in Georgia. I do quite a bit of political work in Georgia. By, by training, I'm a political historian. So um, I participate in, in campaigns uh, of candidates that I like, and I give them talking points, and I give them historical understandings and whatever, whatnot. Even in Georgia, what you've seen with the recent bluing, and, and we're not sure if, it, if Georgia is actually blue or if it was just a referendum uh, on, on the previous president and some of the things that are taking place. We're not sure about that. But even with that, it's a black woman from Alabama who made the, 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 the difference, a sister by the name of Latasha Brown with Black Voters Matters. I mean, she's getting on buses. She's going to all these places. She went to Philadelphia. She went to Detroit. She went to Milwaukee. She was in California. She caught COVID doing this, this kind of work. Mm. The thing about it is Alabama has not been been able, has not progressed because we oftentimes, and, and even in Georgia, we're talking about Atlanta. We're not talking about Georgia. And we got to be, we gotta be clear on that. Because yeah, Atlanta is not Georgia. <laughs> and and, and, and that's a, that is a tension there. I mean, black, white, urban, rural, it's, it, it's that urban, rural is, is just as divisive as anything else. I mean- um, you, you think about it like this. I mean, if, if someone in, in um, um, Cordelia, Georgia, if they were voting and Atlanta is to receive a transportation grant and that's a, the lion's share of it, they're not the, the black person in Cordelia, Georgia is like, well, we're not getting anything from this. So why should we give Atlanta everything? That, so there's a tension there. But the, the, the thing about it is the state of Alabama has gone unchecked. I mean, the gerrymandering. Uh, the voter suppression, 
um, the, the, the aspects of poverty and all kinds of different things. Alabama has been able to remain privatized in particular ways. Alabama has been unjust and has uh, situated itself in being unjust. unjust. Um, we see, you know, real conversation. I mean, the Shelby, Shelby v. Holder court case that strikes, you know, the provisions from the, the Voting Rights Act of 1964, which grants universal suffrage or universal right to vote. We see all of that as under attack. And you have a series of legislators there who are in lockstep with really tightening the grip on civil and human rights. All right. Uh, just I'm going to touch on this quickly and then we'll come back because we want to get Michael and Barbara in sure. here. You've also been involved in uh, several movies uh, from a documentary standpoint, from a historian standpoint. Just give me a brief uh, summation of that. So, you know, I've been one of the things that I feel as if I'm blessed to do that a lot of other professors aren't able to do is uh, I speak plain English uh, and I can boil down very complicated conversations into some really cool sound bites. I mean, you just you just speak, talk it down on the ground to, to regular people. Uh, and because of that, uh, I have a thorough working knowledge of both U.S. history and African-American history um, and able to present it in the public to where people can understand it. Um, I was blessed to be the chief historian for uh, the Maynard Jackson documentary that debuted on Netflix and flew around the world. I was chief historian for um, the art of organized noise that tells the life and times of organized noise. Tell me, uh, tell me, excuse me for cutting you off, but when sure. you say chief historian, explain what that means so that people will know what you're doing. So, so chief historian, truly, it, what it usually means is that when, when the documentary is done, you have to go through and historically make sure that it's accurate. You have to be able to provide the kind of context around it. Because sometimes when you do documentaries, some, some people will make it be, hey, geographical, meaning that, you know, I'm, I want to do a documentary on my mom and I think she's the best person in the world. And this is what she did. Well, the chief historian comes in and says, OK, I understand that. But it's clear that, you know, your mom shot two people on this day for this reason. <laughs> Somebody has to be able to deal with okay. the, the, the total kind of understanding. And so with the Maynard Jackson documentary, I mean, I was sitting in the room with Vernon Jordan. I'm sitting in the room with an Andrew Young, with with Al Sharpton, with President Bill Clinton. And my job was to keep it straight, but also to give the talking points to provide the historical context that will allow for us to focus on the individual or the subject matter. Um, so, 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 so that I uh, did the art of organized noise that details the life and times of organized noise. I was chief historian for the Michael Vick documentary, which really situates Michael Vick on ESPN 30 for 30 hip hop evolution. Um, with hip hop evolution, everything on the dirty South. I mean, you know, I, I was the one who gave the historical context for the Atlanta missing and murdered. I actually served as a producer in terms of a consulting producer, which means that most of the people who show up in the documentary, I put them there. So I was the contact person okay. in terms of if you want the mothers, if you want particular activists, if you want the lawyers, I was the person because I have that work and knowledge and have a relationship with those folks. Um, I do that kind of work. So um, I have several more documentaries where I'm a chief historian that, that are about to debut. So we look forward to it. And so I'm blessed to be in that, 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 that particular uh, chartered waters. Sounds great, man. You are different from, uh, you're involved in a lot of different things, which makes you a different educator, so to speak. Let's get Michael and Barbara in here. I know they got some questions, and then we, you and I will come back. Barbara, you had some questions for Maurice? I do. Good morning, Maurice. How are you today? I am fantastic. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you. First, I want to send greetings to you from um, one of your mega brothers and Boule brothers. Tom will speak with him last night. He asked me to tell you both. I'm sure he and his beautiful wife, Barbara, uh, are listening this morning. But um, one of the questions I have is, um, since your book came out, uh, The Legend of the Black Mecca, Politics and Class in the Making of Martin, Martin Atlanta, that came out in 2017. Since that time, has, has Atlanta changed drastically? Or, or how, what would you say is the difference now between time and, and, and today? So, you know, if this is a great question. Um, my book was supposed to debut in 2016 and the press delayed it. And uh, it, it caused some heartburn and anxiety because I was going up for tenure. You have to write a book to keep to get tenure and promote it. Um, but that was really universal timing. That was really God's timing because had the book come out in 2016, I could not have been dog catcher in Atlanta. But what happens right. in terms of that universal timing 
is that the Maynard Jackson documentary debuts with the book and also Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms was in a dog fight with Mary Norwood, who was threatening to be the first black mayor in 50 years in Atlanta. And, and, and yeah, in 50, not 50, uh, 45 years or so in Atlanta. And so as a result of that, when the book debuts and the Maynard Jackson documentary debuts, it kind of puts Atlanta in this moment. And one of the things we saw with that mayoral election is that everything north was red for Mary Norwood and everything south was blue for Keisha Lance Bottoms, which means that Atlanta is extremely segregated. It's not the city too busy to hate or the black Mecca or hot Atlanta that people want it to be. And so the book becomes the roadmap for that. Has Atlanta changed since then? Um, no. Um, Atlanta, you know, is a city that is struggling with urban renewal and gentrification. Uh, in 2018, I think, I mean, in 1990, Atlanta was um, 67 percent of African American descent. Now it's 51.5 percent. And that's a result of urban renewal gentrification. Um, Atlanta has, you know, struggled with a cheating scandal that is that is, you know, set back a generation of black and brown children. So when we talk about this whole conversation, uh, has Atlanta changed since 2017? No, we, we're still in the throes. But this pandemic and the witnessing of public sanctioned murders uh, of black folk by the police has really made Atlanta take a real look at itself. So I, I, I think it's both and. I think, yes, it's changed and no, it hasn't. So. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, uh, Michael? Yes, I have several questions as usual, but I'm going to start with this one first. And uh, Let's talk about reparations <clears throat> from a historical standpoint. That's a subject that everybody's looking at. And uh, someone we all know, Herschel Walker, who played at University of Georgia, he has come out and said that he does not support reparations and that reparations uh, cause a separation. Um, I totally disagree with that, and I have my own reasons, but I'd like to hear your perspective from a historical standpoint, because we know America has paid reparations to other people. That's so right. why not black people? So, you know, Herschel Walker does not speak for me. He doesn't speak for black communities. I'm not saying I speak for black communities, but but Brother Walker, you asked me what I thought, so I'm going to give you what, what I think. Um, reparations. And, I'm no, and let's get the record straight. Yeah. I'm of no relations to Herschel Walker. I, 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 I went to Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let it be known. Sing it from the rooftops. But, but you know, um, Herschel Walker has benefited from, he's benefited from um, being in cahoots with folks who support that particular kind of ideology. And what he's done is he's essentialized his experience as the experience. I mean, I, I, we could even take it from this perspective. You know, one of the things that Herschel Walker is known for is his legendary workouts, his sit-ups and push-ups. That, like, that's pretty much what it is. I mean, hey, he's an exceptional human being just doing that. So we're not even talking about the Heisman Trophy and all the you know, USFL and NFL accolades. But the thing about it is his reparations should be considered. And I don't know exactly how it should be administered, though. And what I'm saying is you may not want to give a lump sum of money because someone can different folk have different values in terms of they can spend up all the money and then be in the same predicament. We don't want to put it in terms of education because not everybody is working to get a particular kind of education, whether college education or whatever, whatnot. But we must consider consider it because, you know, reparations have been paid, paid to, to, to Japanese uh, communities, Japanese American communities, to Jewish communities. Um, we, we've seen some semblance to uh, indigenous communities. Um, but for black folk who really made this country wealthy, I mean, it's, it's free labor. Uh, yeah. We see something particular. I mean, um, the Dean made the statement earlier about the 1808 transatlantic slavery. And see, from the onset of the founding of this, this country, the, the American South was always at war because they understood that their political economy was slavery. And after 1808, when cotton becomes king and slavery really becomes lucrative, they begin to smuggle Africans by the millions into the southeastern United States of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, Tennessee for cotton. And so when we start talking about that, which, I mean, let me give you all an example of something and then I'll, I'll leave this alone. In 1860, on the eve of the American Civil War, Mississippi was the richest state in the United States. Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama and Georgia basically shared in about 71% of all of the cotton that was produced. And that one year, the cotton alone 
was worth in today's terms $126 billion. Just the cotton. We're not talking about the ships. We're not talking about the maintenance of the enslaved Africans. We're not talking about the cotton mills. So what I'm, what I'm saying is when you're making that kind of money, this is what I do with my students, particularly my black students. When you're making that kind of money, you understand that laws are created to keep you in place. So I think that um, Herschel Walker needs a real lesson in history, and he needs that real come to Jesus moment that we talk about in the black community. Agreed. One, one, one thing I'd like to just add about Herschel, Herschel played in the USFL, and he played in the USFL for the New Jersey Generals, which was owned at the time by Donald Trump. So, and I know he supported uh, the former president uh, in the last election, but I figure that was because Trump probably still owed him some money from the USFL days. <laughs> He's trying to collect his money like everybody else. <laughs> and, and, and that's an aspect of that's an aspect of these political games too. It's an aspect of I mean, you know, folk, when money is involved, I mean, people do different things. So, and I'm, so you know, I, I love the brother as a running back for the Dallas Cowboys. I, you know, so you know, hey. <laughs> I hear you. Let's see who's up. Barbara, were you up or? Yeah, I, I do have another question. Um, you you mentioned uh, earlier that this. Atlanta is known as the city too busy to hate. How did they get that tagline and, and what does it really mean? So in the 1950s, um, the mayor of Atlanta, William Hartsville, um, his administration came up with this slogan. And what Atlanta understood is that the, the American South was sweltering with issues around uh, segregation, around hate, white supremacy. So what happens is... Um, I mean, you got Little Rock that's that's bucking. You got Montgomery that's bucking. You got Jackson, Mississippi that's going all the way. You you got all the New Orleans. You got the Carolinas that are that are that are acting out in particular ways. And so, what Hartsville understood is that if they could present a um, a business model, if they could really kind of package Atlanta as a city too busy to hate, they would get the lion's share of all of the opportunities for any American Southern city. And so what they did was they played into something. Well, in the 1940s, what happens is there is a Supreme Court case, uh, King v. Chapman, where a black man by the name of Primus King challenges the all-white Georgia primary. It goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court makes the all-white Georgia primary uh, unconstitutional. The all-white Georgia primary is that only white people could vote in the beginning, and then a few black people could vote later on. So basically, the primary stacked the deck. Okay, When this happens... John Wesley Dobbs and A.T. Walden, John Wesley Dobbs was Maynard Jackson's uh, grandfather, create the Atlanta Negro Voters League, 36 of the most prominent black men in Atlanta, black men who could negotiate with the white business elite in Atlanta, Coca-Cola, you know, the banks, all these different things. And basically what happens with this is that it is seen as an Atlanta style of biracial negotiation. Well, William Hartsfield takes that to the next level, markets it for the city of Atlanta and says, Look, we're the city too busy to hate. We're not Birmingham. We're not Montgomery. We're not Jackson. We're not Little Rock. And because of that, particularly in the early 1960s, with Ivan Allen as mayor and John F. Kennedy as president, Kennedy sees Atlanta as the poster child for race relations. And thus you get things like, you know, money for the airport, money for infrastructure, six flags. You get the, the sporting franchises in 66, 67, 68. So it's a mark, it was a marketing strategy. One of the things I'll argue about Atlanta is it's a great city. I love this city, but it's hubris. It's marketing. It's boosterism. It's just as great as anything else that it can do. It is. And it is. And that's one of the reasons uh, yes. I, I think that it moved way past Birmingham, mm -hmm. being involved in a lot of the yes. community and civic things in Birmingham. Uh, you could see there were things that we were just not willing to do that Atlanta was willing to do. Exactly. And uh, right. including uh, including the airport, including Delta, including Coca-Cola, all those things that could have that all those that could have been possibilities. Yeah. In Alabama. And, and, and Birmingham was the big city. Birmingham yes, was the big it was. city, but it, 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 it had some, yes. some serious problems and it could have had the airport because yeah. it's in the center of the American South. Exactly. I mean, you, can, you can access. Right. But it didn't do it. And Atlanta understood that and, and took the and took the title. Exactly. Uh, um, Michael? Yes. Um, in conversations, you brought up Maynard Jackson a couple times. In my estimation, Maynard, 
probably was the most important figure in Atlanta history as far as generating wealth for black people in Atlanta. Had it not been for him, we would not have the black elite here in Atlanta. Do you agree? Uh, give me some comments on that. Absolutely. I, let me tell you all something. I um, I have the absolute full admiration of Maynard Jackson. I consider it to be one of the best uh, moments of my life, one of the greatest honors of my life to actually be the chief historian for the Maynard Jackson documentary. And, 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 and Brother Walker, uh, who's not related to Herschel Walker, um, <laughs> you, you live in Atlanta, so you know Atlanta is a funny town. If you're not from Atlanta, you That's you true. have to kind of work to get good with, with Atlanta. Absolutely. Um, for me to be involved in that and not be from Atlanta really speaks volumes. But I'll, I'll say this. Maynard Jackson, one of the things about Maynard Jackson that is that's not articulated in the film, but I, I articulated in my book is that Maynard, his grandfather was John Wesley Dobbs. And a lot of what you see was actually implemented by John Wesley Dobbs. So he's carrying his grandfather's mantle. But Maynard is gone out of Atlanta during the real classical phase of the civil rights movement. He moves back to Atlanta in 1966. And in many ways, he feels as if he's kind of missed the civil rights movement because he's in law school. When he gets his opportunity, it's when Dr. King is assassinated and Robert F. Kennedy is assassinated is when he decides to run for the U.S. Senate. He loses, but he carries Atlanta. He runs for vice mayor. He becomes mayor. What he does is he transitions civil rights. His idea of civil rights was economic accessibility. And he gives 35 percent of all city contracts to minority contractors. Now, what this means is Maynard Jackson was mayor for 12 years, um, 1973 to 1981. 1989, 1993, and Andrew Young was mayor in between, two black mayors, and Maynard set up Andy to, to run for mayor. Within those years, you have about $10 billion that comes through the city of Atlanta. They give 35% of 10 billion to black contractors, 3.5 billion to black contracts. They produce a lot of black millionaires. And so it's Maynard Jackson who was able to really see that, to really, um, to, to really promote what now is considered to be the gold standard in terms of uh, uh, affirmative action public and public and private sector. So Maynard Jackson, I absolutely uh, think the world of him. And I only met him one time in my life. I was five years old and I remember it like it was yesterday. So, you know, it was a it was an honor and pleasure to be that historian for that documentary. Absolutely. I had the opportunity to meet him going through Leadership Atlanta. He OK. Speak and we spoke and talked and had some conversation as well. But I think he's an unsung hero. He doesn't get the accolades that he should for contributing to the black wealth in Atlanta. I, I, and, and, and to the rest of the nation. I mean, I, I've, I'm trying to sing his praises. We're working on, uh, you know, talking with his family, working on manuscripts about his life. We're also looking at different things that we can develop. Um, but I admired Maynard Jackson. I admired him with everything that I have. And so it's, and that's very different than what you'll read. I'm not saying that I talk crazy about him in my book, but I was, I had to be critical because we have to look at all facts. Sure. But personally, he is my political mentor from the grave. So. Let's see, Karen Butler, some of our con Karen Butler wants to know if any of you all are on social media. I assume all of you are to, to some extent. Uh, Dwayne Scott yes, says, hello. Um, Barbara says, I guess it's from Selma, Alabama, not Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I actually, I was born in Jackson, Mississippi, and my family is Mississippi, straight up Mississippi, Mississippi roots, uh, down to the coast. But I did grow up in Selma, Alabama. The S town is home. My mother is there. My sisters are there. Um, I'm a Selma saint until the day I die. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed to be one of those persons I have numerous hometowns, but Selma, Alabama is very, very, very much in my life. And I love it. <laughs> let me, uh, let's talk about the film and television business in Georgia and how that has, uh, Tom Larkin, Tom Larkin says, hello. How you doing uh, brother Tom? Brother Tom is responsible for one of the people responsible for me being a member of Omega Sci-Fi. So, <laughs> okay. 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 Good. Tom and Barbara Miller, uh, says hello. So let's, the, the, you know, one of the things that's happened, and I, I live in Florida, and there is a, a very much a resistance in the Florida legislature to incentives for the film and television business. Um, there have been a lot of things said. Some of the things said is, well, it'll bring the wrong kind of people into Florida. 
Now, you know, that's that's code language, mm -hmm. uh, which we're very, very familiar with. Atlanta has moved past that, and the film and television business is huge there. It's pretty much where I got my start. Can you just speak to the film and TV business in Atlanta? In absolutely. Georgia. In Georgia. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, this goes back to Maynard Jackson. It goes back to Maynard Jackson, and I, I have to put this out there. In 1973, then Governor Jimmy Carter, later becomes President Jimmy Carter, um, promotes a tax incentive called the Georgia Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment uh, Office Tax Incentive. And it gave incentives for uh, music, for digital entertainment movies and whatever, whatnot, to come to Georgia. And one would receive you know, serious tax breaks. Well, what happens with this is, I mean, the movie Deliverance is able to kind of emerge in the mid 1970s as a result of this. You got a series of movies that, and you know, the, the Smoke and the Bandit franchise and Bingo Long and the, and the All-Stars, all of these different, you know, pieces come. What happens with this though, is Maynard Jackson understands what's happening with that on the state level and takes it even further where he takes 1% sales tax from the city of Atlanta to create the Bureau of Cultural Affairs which supports experiential art, you know, digital music, um, visual arts, all kinds of art um, for the city of Atlanta. And one of the, the crown jewel of the, the, now the Office of Cultural Affairs is the Atlanta Jazz Festival, which is the, the, big, the world's largest um, free and open access jazz festival in the world. Well, as a result of that, Maynard Jackson began to give grants back into the city for art. You also understand that the fine arts curriculum at the Atlanta University Center was already vibrant. You had a very spirited local artist group. So what we begin to see is what happens in Atlanta is it's not just about like these blockbusters, but you see black expressive culture. You see black movies. You see uh, Atlanta is now the capital of hip hop. I mean, all, you see all of this stuff. And this is how Maynard Jackson is able to weaponize that tax incentive. And so when you see that peach on on all of these different um movies and TV shows and whatever, whatnot, that tax incentive, I, I can't remember what the exact number is, but I think that you get a, like a 40% discount or something like that. Yeah. If you're able to do it, I think it's matched up to 40% or something, uh, or something of that nature. That's huge. I mean, if you, if you, if you hear spending a hundred million dollars, you know, on, on a film that you're producing with some kind of, you know, special, you know, you know, digital stuff and all kind of, you know, theatrics and all this kind of stuff. I don't want to say CGI, but all this, real digital stuff you spend a hundred million dollars and you only have to pay 60 because you're getting some of that money back i mean it would make me want to come here and do um movies but also atlanta's amenable to where you can make it be look like new york or you can make it look like chicago you can it it, it has flexibility to do to do all kinds of different things it's so got, so yeah it's got a great location i mean you've got the city but you've got a lot of rural locations exactly areas that that can be anywhere in the country uh, exactly you got mountains you got lakes you got you got all of it you know and i can say i know that in the heat of the night started there i think it was like in 1987 um, uh connor in there and they they located there and they stayed there for the run of that show of about seven years uh which was pretty incredible grew an infrastructure grew when i say an infrastructure i mean they grew crews they grew uh, directors, actors, videographers, and so on and so forth, which has made that industry pretty much what it is in Georgia uh, today. So, uh, Michael, you got another question here? As we, yes, uh, <clears throat> I actually have two, but I'll, I'll cut it off. One was I wanted to talk about Marvin Arrington, uh, but let's talk about Wayne Mason and the child murders. You worked on that documentary. Did he do it and why? So uh, Wayne Williams and the Atlanta child murders. Uh, so this is an interesting thing. Um, there are a lot, there's, most recently there's been a lot of interest that have, that have come about the Atlanta child murders. And, um, but none of it has actually done the empirical dive, the historical archival court cases, interviews with mothers like I did in The Legend of the Black Mecca, Chapter 3, The Sorrow of the City. And so one of the things, when you really look at the metrics, there is more than one killer. 
and there are more than 30 victims. They'll say 29 victims. I argue in my book, 30, I, I have proof, but there are more than those victims, a lot more than those victims. And it was outside, it was from roughly around 1975 to 1985. The thing about it is the two men that Wayne Williams was accused of killing and, and was convicted of, uh, of killing, it was deemed as inconclusive as to whether or not they were actually murdered. And the thing about it is the Atlanta child murders was a black eye on the city's PR. How can you be the city too busy to hate? How can you be the black Mecca? How can you be Dr. King's hometown? And black children, poor black children are being left out in the streets to, to decompose. How can you do that? So, and looking at all the evidence, um, I will say this on record. I think that, there, I mean, I know that there's more than one killer, uh, probably about six killers. But if you're asking the question on whether or not, and, and this is how the law works, the proof of burden is on the state. Right. If, you, if you're asking if the prosecution proved that Wayne Williams be, uh, uh, killed those kids beyond a shadow of a doubt, no. Is Wayne Williams a, an unusual character with a, a lot of layers? Absolutely. And, and so the thing about it is, um, by and large, you know, history is a study of facts and what people believe about facts. If you talk to many of the mothers who are still alive, many of them will say Wayne Williams didn't do it. And they have a lot, there's a lot more information out there than what the city may know about and whatever, whatnot. Uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of working closely with Lynn Watley, Wayne Williams' attorney, and I've been able to see some of the things that are available, and it's, it's extremely eye opening. What's what, what uh, just out of curiosity, is he did he get life? Is he is he in for life? He got a double life sentence, um, twenty five years for each. Uh, he was put in prison thirty nine years ago. Um, so so yeah, and then he's had some run ins. I mean, several years ago, maybe a year ago or so, he he was caught with a cell phone in prison. So I don't know if that you know adds time or if that kind of infringement you know adds time. But um, he 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 is a. He is a very unique character, but to say that he committed those murders, um, it, I, I, I would not be comfortable with convicting him and thinking that justice was served. Let me, I got a couple of comments here. Uh, Karen Butler says, um, this is awesome. I can't believe I've just come across this podcast. Well, Karen, you tell everybody about it and you come back and uh, we'll be here. As a matter of fact, we'll have our 25th show uh, I think next week we will have been around for 25 shows. So, and uh, Jeff Hedrick asked, were the killers connected or were they random and unconnected? Uh, so I think some of the killers were connected and some of them were random and unconnected. So um, there were, I mean, if you want to go, uh, go down race lines, I mean, they were black and white killers. Um, and during this time, I, I want y'all to understand this. In 1979, when the murders supposedly started, there were 50,000 missing children, 3,000 children that died, uh, you know, that year because of sexual abuse or something. So, like, this has been an issue in the, in the United States. Um, so I think that there may be different motives at work. You, you got, I mean, you know, if you're, killing, if you're killing anybody, I mean, you're a sick individual. But if you're out here killing children and the ways in which the children were found in the fields and stuff, I mean, that's particular, but you have different motives, different ideas. And so some of the killers are connected and some of them are not. Okay. Uh, Maurice, before we go, let me just let you, you got something else you'd like to give us before we go. I mean, there's so, it's so interesting and there's so much here and I don't want to overlook anything that you might want to bring up. Um, well, I, I know uh, brother Michael was going to ask me about Marvin Arrington, who is a stalwart here in the, uh, in the city of Atlanta, and particularly in terms of the legal field, he's a judge. Um, I had the pleasure, the distinct pleasure of sitting as the chief historian for the documentary on Marvin Arrington well, that would debut was done by his children. Um, uh, his daughter, Michelle, went to college with my brother and she's always been real cool and Marvin Jr. has always been real cool. And so, um, listen, we, we do full scale African-American history and US history, we do political history and we're just really trying to promote democracy we're trying to promote love. We're trying to believe in this country. We're trying to make this country great. We, we ain't even talked about the again part. We're just we're trying to get it to be great. <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to leave the again right. part off. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Thank you guys so much. Man, Morris, that was great. We're going to have to get you to come back and uh, talk to us yeah. about some other stuff and some of the things you're involved in. As a matter of fact, just a full disclosure, Maurice and I are involved in a on a on a film project, series of film projects that we're 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 uh, attempting to pull together. Uh, hopefully, it's going to come together, and and uh, we'll be talking about it on the show at some point. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. So, well, thank you guys so much. Uh, Okay, we're going to move forward. Uh, that was just great. Uh, thank Maurice, Michael, Barbara. Uh, we're going to move forward. It's a wrap. Let me just leave you with this final quote. History. History is made up of individual moments, and today is one of our moments. So I want to thank Michael, thank Barbara, uh, thank uh, Maurice. Uh, that's our show. Thank our sponsor, Best Girl. If you're interested in having your business be a sponsor of the show, get in touch with us. I want to thank Emily Hedrick, the communicator, our producer. Thanks, Sean Jones, the organizer. It's a wrap. Enjoy yourself. Make every day count. Stay safe and peace.